the internal markets bill where we are, have seen the true colours of Boris Johnson's Conservative Party really being on display. A Prime Minister who negotiated, signed, put to the British people uh, and then put into British law a withdrawal agreement that only a few short months later he is trashing along with our international reputation and our uh, long-term commitment and support for the rule of law and the international rules-based system. That is what we face. Uh, and I've just listened to Theresa, Theresa May eviscerate the government uh, that she led only just over a year ago. She announced to the House of Commons she's not going to support the government on this bill. Uh, and a quite extraordinary moment um, in democratic history for this country and she set out clearly the same arguments that we do that you cannot go back on your on, on what you commit to uh, it is just not the way to work she cited the Salisbury poisonings and the support we had from the international community against Russia where will that support come from in the future she gave brilliant examples of uh, just how important it is that we keep our word. And she dealt with the interventions from Bill Cash, who she swatted aside like a little gnat uh, that is uh, buzzing around and that uh, you have to, uh, have to deal with in no uncertain terms. Uh, and pointed out that his argument is that uh, if someone else breaks the, the law, then it's okay if we do. Well, that's no kind of example to set if you are the ones who want to lead by example and uh, I never thought the day would come Anna where I would start quoting Margaret Thatcher but the day has come the day has arrived and in a speech in 1975 she said Britain does not renounce treaties indeed to do so would damage our own integrity as well as international relations and in 1982 she said I believe Britain has now found a role it is in upholding international law and teaching the nations of the world how to live. Well, this is no longer the party of Theresa May. It is no longer even the party of Margaret Thatcher, it seems. Um, and we heard in recent days, uh, people who voted Remain and people who voted Leave, prominent in the Conservative Party, all the former leaders who are still alive with the uh, dishonourable exception of Ian Duncan Smith, uh, taking the government to task. Uh, Michael Howard, with his legal background, for setting, setting things out very strongly. The recent Attorney General, Geoffrey Cox, taking them to task uh, as, as well. Uh, and they can all see what we can see, just how dangerous and damaging this will be for our reputation, for our ability to negotiate anywhere in the world. We already hear from Joe Biden, from Nancy Pelosi, that a U US trade deal is off the table because of the threat to uh, peace in Northern Ireland. Uh, and the reality is that Boris Johnson uh, has invented problems. He has lied about the threat of a blockade. Uh, he has lied about the issues of state aid and customs clearances, all of which are dealt with in the withdrawal agreement um, where there, are, uh, there is a joint committee and the government still will not answer whether they have raised these so-called concerns in the joint committee. Um, and Paul Blomfield, my colleague, uh, put that to them again um, a, few, a, a few minutes ago. A and they uh, are ignoring the fact that a dispute resolution mechanism is hardwired into the arrangements. Uh, and that actually break it, it, and, and then it goes to binding arbitration. And if the terms of that arbitration are broken, that, then it, on its own is breaking international law. So we have to hold them to account for this. We will hold them to account for the promises they made. We've left the European Union, but we, ne we still need to negotiate an agreement because the alternative for jobs, whether it's in manufacturing or services, the prospects for the uh, potential for shortages of food in our supermarket shelves and for um, delays at the ports are just too terrible to contemplate. We will continue to hold them to account. It looks like there are still conservatives and <laughs> led by Theresa May who are going to hold out. It is um, very worrying that some seem to have been bought out by government um, promises because it is not the implementation of this uh, bill when it goes into law that is, that is only the, the only problem. 
it is putting it on the statute uh, books that breaks international law. We will continue to point that out. We will continue to fight against it. And we will continue to make the case for the closest relationship for all of the reasons that I touched on at the start and all the reasons that we all passionately believe in as pro-Europeans. Thank you very much, Bill. That's a, that's a great insight and thank you for sharing that. And it is, it does say, it's, as you said, it comes to something when we're on the same side of the argument of both Theresa May and Margaret Thatcher, <laughs> who knew? But um, I think it says everything about the scale of the vandalism um, of this of this government, um, wrecking international law, wrecking Britain's standing in the world, that uh, even even some conservative politicians, it's, it's enough, enough is enough even for them. So we're in dark times, but thank you for continuing to fight that fight, because as you say, you know, we do have to have an agreement we do have to protect what we can um, for, from this uh, from this government's act of, uh, of devastation so thank you for all you're doing um, I'm delighted now to um, go to Richard Corbett and I'm going to just ask him to unmute if we can work the technology brilliant work the technology between us um, Richard's been a, a, an MEP I think since 1996 is that right Richard so he knows mm -hmm. With, a, yeah, with I mean, an interruption for five with years. It, with, yeah, 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 a minor sabbatical. Yeah. Um, but he knows the European Union inside out, and obviously he's been at the heart of um, the last few years of negotiation. Um, I hope I haven't frozen there. Um, yeah, and obviously he was the leader of the um, Labour group in uh, the European Parliament um, when, when we lost our seats there. So he knows exactly um, the place inside out, and we really look forward to having his insight. So Richard, over to you. Well, thank you very much and lovely to, to see everybody. Um, uh, I'm going to look at it from a different perspective because I think Bill covered the current problems very well and look at um, what we should argue, we as Labour Party, we as Labour Movement for Europe, um, as we face the end of these negotiations and what comes next. We've also got to beware, therefore, there's a short term and there's a long term and we mustn't, we must make sure that the arguments we use in the short term don't undermine what we might want to say in the longer term as we deal with this issue that changes week by week. In the immediate, while the negotiations are continuing, we should of course, as we are saying, say we want a deal, we don't want a no deal outcome. But I think we should say a little bit more than that, that we, the simple negative of we don't want no deal. We should be saying what sort of deal we actually want the government to negotiate. Not that we have any illusions that we're likely to get everything, but to lay down a marker of what sort of deal we should have. And there are two key words there, a deal that gives us access and a deal that preserves our standards. Access, that's access of course to the single market, both for our supply chains and for our exports. Millions of jobs are at stake. Access to Europol and police cooperation. Access to research and university cooperation. Access to Erasmus. Access to the myriad of um, technical cooperations, technical agencies, and so on. That, all those things are things we have that we risk losing and which are clearly beneficial and individually enjoy public support for us keeping that access. Second thing we want to keep is our standards, keep our European standards on food safety, on workers' rights, on environmental standards, on consumer protections. All these things that the Tories indeed want to undermine, that's one of the reasons why some of them wanted Brexit in the first place, was to get us away from European standards to have a, a free-for-all market, American-style corporate market. So that's what we should be advocating. They're things that we have, we risk losing. Um, mostly the public wants to keep those things and we should be pressing the government for that. Now I'm not under any illusion that they will deliver on all that but it sets down a marker and a positive vision about what a deal could be. They won't get that deal. It'll either be a bad deal, a bare bones deal or no deal but those issues 
even then won't go away. For some time to come, we will be grappling with how to have access to one or another or all of those things. We will still be having arguments about our standards. So that works both in the short run, the immediate, and in the medium term as well to argue for those things. But in any case, while we are doing that, and looking at the likely mess they're making of it, and there's certainly the outcomes they are heading for, we should continue to say that this whole exercise is wrong for Britain. Brexit is bad for Britain. We were right to oppose it. Yes, Boris Johnson won a general election with his promises, which are now already unravelling. Yes, they won a referendum with a promise about Brexit that is now unravelling. But you can certainly say that what is emerging bears no resemblance to what was promised. That's why it's legitimate to question it and to say that this is actually bad for Britain. You can attenuate how bad it is for Britain with a good deal that keeps access and keeps our standards, but let us not acquiesce and flip over and say, yeah, Brexit is a good thing, it's what the British people wanted. It is a myth that the British people wanted it. The last general election, 53% of people voted for parties that wanted another referendum, a rethink about this, and since then the opinion polls have shifted even further. That's particularly important for Labour, because most Labour voters, even before, certainly now, want, were opposed to Brexit. Most of the sort of soft centre voters that we need to win over to Labour are also anti-Brexit or critical of Brexit. So we mustn't flip in completely to the other side of what we had previously said. Yes, we accept Brexit has happened. Yes, we are saying we want a deal that keeps us close to the European Union. We are not now reopening the question of rejoining as a, as a political party. That's something to consider for the future. The immediate issues are keeping access, keeping standards, keeping close to the European Union. But we should not therefore flip in the opposite direction. And when it comes to voting on a deal, we may well not want to trigger a no-deal Brexit, but that's not a reason to vote for a bare-bones deal, a bad deal, a Tory deal. We could perfectly well abstain to say, well, this is to avoid a no-deal situation, but this is nonetheless a bad deal that's not in the interests of the British people, and make sure that we keep the credibility of our position with the bulk of our voters and probably now the bulk of the electorate that are increasingly critical of what the government is doing, partly because it bears no resemblance whatsoever to what they promised. Oh, and one other thing, as LME, as Labour Movement for Europe, we rather than as the party, we need to advocate that especially because we are the LME, and if the LME isn't saying that, we risk others saying, well, even the Labour Movement for Europe isn't arguing this or isn't arguing that. So we have a particular duty to be um, the outrider, shall we say, in this debate. Thank you very much, Richard. I think that's absolutely spot on. We all have to be realistic. Um, as someone who, you know, lost their seat because of what, the, you know, the election of December, you know, we, we have to be realistic about where we are. But that doesn't mean that actually we just, as you say, roll over. Brexit wasn't the number one issue on the doorsteps for me here. Um, you know, I, I, I agree with you that actually if we, if we throw everything into that, we are, we are conceding an argument that A, it's morally not right to, to concede, and B, we're then throwing away everything that we need to fight for in terms of the issues you set out there, access and rights and defending our, our rights and so on. So um, you're absolutely right, we have to continue to push. Um, and as the Labour Movement for Europe, we are the vanguard really of, of this movement and of the, uh, you know, the pro-Europeans within the Labour Party. And that's our, that's our responsibility to do so. So thank you very much. That was very insightful. Um, I'm going to now ask Horace to, uh, to, to speak to us. Horace is the General Secretary of the Musicians' Union. Um, sorry, bear with me as I unmute him. Um, 
and uh, obviously the mus musicians around this country have been already hugely uh, impacted by by Brexit and the uncertainty alongside what's happening with Covid must make it a really difficult situation for Britain's musicians and uh, we know the importance of, of this industry to, to our economy in this country. So, Horace, over to you. If, if you could unmute yourself, that would be great. Is that yeah, yeah that's it. There? Thank you, Anna. Thanks very much. Okay. Yeah, look, um, uh, I'm not going to talk about the internal market, Bill, because uh, everything that Bill said, I agree with, and, and clearly he's got a very good handle on it, probably better than, my, than I have. Um, I'm going to talk about the impact that. Uh, Brexit's going to have on working people, my working people, musicians, um, because I think it's really important that with all the sort of high, uh, political hyperbole around Brexit, that people are reminded of the actual, you know, coalface impact that uh, a no deal Brexit particularly will have on certain areas of work. And, and for music, it's particularly worrying. Um, it's, it's safe to say that my members are are going through probably the worst crisis that we've ever experienced uh, as a trade union since uh, they introduced uh, talky films into the cinemas uh, and all the orchestras that previously played to the um, you know, silent movies were sacked. That was a, a huge crisis back in the 20s for the MU, but this crisis we're suffering with the pandemic is even greater. Uh, and it will be compounded if uh, there is a no deal Brexit and my members can't fulfill the engagements that they've already got in the book uh, for working in Europe. Musicians aren't like engineers or builders who go and work in Europe because you know you generally find a, an engineer or a builder or someone uh, other than a musician who works in Europe will go to one country they will do the work in their that country and they'll come home. Um, musicians tend to go to three or four countries in a two-week tour um, uh, and that's how they make it pay for them they you know they expand their markets by entering uh, these countries and, and, and playing gigs and then they come back now I'm old enough to remember and I was in a band in the 70s I'm, I remember the days of uh, Carnets uh, and it looks very likely that um, the Carnet system in some form or another may be reintroduced and it's a nightmare. Uh, it was a nightmare then. Uh, I can remember roadies scrabbling under the stage to get the little bits of drumstick that they could stick back together so that they could prove that they hadn't sold a drumstick in a particular European country before moving to the next one, you know. Uh, and guitar strings and saxophone reeds, all the same kind of thing. You had to be meticulous. Uh, and that's an enormous amount of work. As I say, musicians are suffering badly enough. They just about make those European gigs pay for themselves. But if they've got to get work permits and they've got to get carnets, then admin wise, it's just going to become too expensive for them to travel. And this is a 5.2 billion pound industry. Uh, that's what it's worth to the UK economy, uh, that these uh, artists uh, have to expand their markets throughout Europe. Now we've, um, we've consulted our members at length and they've all said that they are going to experience difficulties if they have to get work permits and carnets to work in Europe. And interestingly enough, and I, I always find this statistic fascinating, the music industry itself, you know, the record companies, the managers, the agents, the publishers, etc. It's a very old school, white, capitalist, conservative kind of industry. And you would think that quite a lot of them would, you know, be uh, in favour of Brexit. Because I know these people and I just think, yeah, it's part of their DNA that they would feel like that. Well, 98% of those surveyed in the music industry said that Brexit will be bad for the music industry, uh, which I think is an extraordinary uh, statistic. So we, we've been lobbying hard. We've got 80,000 signatures so far for our petition for a musician's passport, which is basically uh, a renewable uh, permit to enable them to work anywhere in Europe. This is essential for us. And also I want to talk about the fact that musicians coming from European countries to the UK to collaborate with UK musicians is essential for us as well. This is how you get these fantastic mixtures of music that spring out uh, uh, of the UK. A lot of Afrobeat music that comes out of the UK, which is very, very successful at the moment, 
has come from African musicians who work in France predominantly and are resident in France. Uh, and so, you know, without that sort of cross fertilization of musical ideas, the whole sort of growth of culture and music in the UK will be uh, stunted. So there are so many good reasons. And the main problem we've got here, the main problem is neither the DCMS or the government are able to tell us exactly what is going to happen. And this is the problem. There is no advice, there is no guidance available to my members to tell them, who, you know, some have got gigs booked up next year in France, Germany, Italy, Greece, Spain. None of them are, uh, are able to uh, plan and be sure of being able to perform at those gigs because there is absolutely no guidance and advice available to them uh, from the government and the DCMS. And this is what we keep calling out for. We keep saying that, uh, and you know, we can't plan ahead, our members can't plan ahead unless they know exactly what the scenarios are. So if we get a deal, what will it look like? What will it look like for them working in Europe? And if we don't get a deal, what's it going to look like for them working in Europe? These are the questions that keep, you know, we keep asking, but nothing's happening about it. So for an industry and a, a profession that is frankly on its knees right now with no live work ha happened for the last six months you know studio work is starting to pick up again but for musicians who work live all the weddings events conventions congress everything you know that musicians would normally perform at it's all gone uh, so they are really suffering and then they've got this horrible specter of uh brexit hanging over them as well uh, and so it, I, I mean, luckily, the membership numbers of the Musicians Union have, have stayed up. Uh, we're doing OK, but I really don't know how my members are surviving. Uh, extraordinary amount of resilience and creativity is keeping them in this profession. But for how long? We recently surveyed them and said, you know, how many of you have considered leaving the profession? And it was 40 percent of them uh, were considering leaving the profession. If we lose that talent, then we won't get it back. Uh, and as I say, you know, we're the envy of the world. Uh, in terms of the size of our country and the music we create, but that won't last. Uh, coronavirus has had a terrible impact. Brexit will have a similarly awful impact uh, on UK musicians if there is no freedom of movement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Horace. That was, um, well, <laughs> shocking and um, depressing, I'm afraid. Um, and, and, you know, obviously, just so sorry to hear all of your members, the situations that they're in with a double whammy from both COVID and, and Brexit. And I find it astonishing that we're, what, three and a half months away and they, the, the government can't give your members any information about their rights. Um, how can they plan a business? How can they maintain their livelihoods? It's, it's just shocking. And I think you also brought home very powerfully the importance of cultural uh, interaction. And, you know, I get so worried about how we seem to be shifting towards pulling up our drawbridge um being inward looking and isolated and as you said his music thrives on interaction cultural interaction and people coming together across boundaries and um it's you know it's heartbreaking that this is the direction that we're going in where difference is, doesn't seem to be something that's that's valued it's something to, to be scared of so we all have to have a role to play to keep keep that sort of cultural interaction thriving so thank you very much that was that was fascinating um, I'm delighted we've been joined by Eleanor Morgan, um, who is um, the Welsh Minister for International Relations. But first, I'm going to go while we're on the theme of workers' rights and the impact on working people and jobs and livelihoods. I'd like to take Alison Roach. Um, she's a trade union officer at Unison, and um, I think will give us a very powerful insight into the implications for working people, particularly those in the public services that, that Unison represents. But again, we have so many people's livelihoods uh, on the line here. So so, Alison, um, we really look forward to what you've got to say about the implications for, for working people and how, uh, how we can continue to, the Labour Party can continue to negotiate for their rights over the coming months. Um, that's it. Yes. Are you on mute? Thanks, Anna. Thank you. You can hear me, yep. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you uh, very much for that introduction. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say that um, Really what we're looking at is now a hard Brexit or, as we know, a no deal. But it's not really surprising given that um, all the time we've had this negotiation of the future agreement, the government has always wanted to comp compartmentalise a 
a kind of a deal. That was the approach. Whereas the EU did want a comprehensive uh, deal. And um, I think we now see that the reason why the UK government wanted that approach was because it really did want leverage to try and get the hardest Brexit it could. Um, so I'm not surprised we're in the position that we are now where we're facing this stark choice really of just a hard Brexit or um, a no Brexit. But what I did thought was interesting is, and I had to remind myself when I was just thinking about what I wanted to say was, what actually is the difference? What, how would it affect us, this hard Brexit versus uh, a no deal scenario? And um, I thought a hard Brexit fundamentally is a free trade agreement, but it hasn't got all the social provisions in it uh, and it won't have uh, any of the level playing field that um, Richard has talked about. Um, but a free trade agreement uh, without that just allows the UK to have a free hand to negotiate a free trade agreement somewhere else. That's, that's what we've understood through these negotiations. A no deal is very, very different in the sense that it really does crash the economy. It, it really brings uncertainty to business, to every citizens, Northern Irish protocol, etc. So it really is quite reckless, actually, if you begin to think about where we're at and really how the government has brought us to this situation. And, and I kind of really don't understand um, why they've done that. When I was looking today through the TUC stats, I remember compiling a massive sort of um, briefing of about 60 pages of all the terrible things that's going to happen uh, with a no deal. And it really is just horrendous, like wiping out 90 billion pounds, um, social care will collapse because the investment that they need to keep going because it's underfunded. Um, you know, it's very stark what will happen in public services. But more importantly, for the economy as a whole it, and regions, we all know how bad that's going to be. But for business, for business and the uncertainty, it is really dreadful. And I think I can't speak obviously on behalf of business, but we do know like working with NHS employers and we're working with private um, business who run our outsourced um, public services, they're extremely concerned um, about the uncertainty that this is going to bring to public services. I also then just wanted to talk about um, really to me this hard Brexit or no deal is to allow the government to slowly um, diverge away from EU standards and the level playing field. And some of the trade unions, we've been on these expert trade advisory groups. Um, some of them have been thematic, so it could be on public procurement, it could be on e-commerce, it could be on chapters around sustainable um, sustainability chapters, which is your labor clauses, your environmental um, regulations, and the government's removed us all recently without any explanation. But what I did glimpse from um, these, these expert trade advisory groups was actually, we were allowed to discuss every uh, free trade agreement, the key ones the government's trying to promote, Japan, America, Australia, New Zealand, but we weren't allowed to discuss Brexit. And I'll talk a bit more about the implications of that. But what I did glimpse was that the Japanese deal really wasn't anything more than what we've already got with Europe. So why are we trying to promote this as something better? Um, in terms of tariffs or, or how it's gonna add value to our economy, is that there's, it's really just not, not a great deal in that sense. So that seemed strange. Then I found out the Australian deal, we're still trying to find out more. We're having discussions at the moment with Australian trade unions around um, what they think about it. What they've said so far is that the standards that the Australian government puts in trade deals is much lower than what the EU does. So again, it's not a winner. We're not gonna benefit any more than what we've got. And then in the US deal, um, what I found out, and even the government civil servants couldn't hide this, was that it's completely imbalanced about what we're offering the United States and what they're giving us back. They're very strict about the fact, for example, in public procurement, where you would open up your public services to privatization, 
that they are not willing to give us um, state access to those, uh, those markets. It's only going to be federal, but we're going to give all three tiers away. So that's an imbalance that we're not going to benefit from. We also couldn't find out um, where, how, whether the NHS uh, was protected. They just wouldn't show us any of the details. So we've still got no idea about how that sits in this trade deal. And they kind of fudged it really. But what I think the message, and this is actually verbatim what one of the top civil servants said is, the Americans are talking the talk, but they're not walking the walk. So all what I've learned from the government trying to say, okay, we might be losing this, but we're gaining this. I am not seeing any evidence. There's no detail and the civil servants don't seem convinced. So to me, I've got no idea why the government is sacrificing so much for so little. And that's all I can say about my experience on these expert trade advisory groups. Um, the second thing I just wanted to talk about was the NHS. And um, the reason I was talking about it, because I was thinking about the internal market bill that Bill has talked about, because obviously the trade unions and TUC, we've been working with that with Ed Miliband, and we'll go into the laws doing a bit more around that. And I won't particularly go into um, the details around that. But I was just thinking about the NHS, about the fact it's not really protected at the moment in any of these free trade agreements the government's going to enter us from. But secondly, I was just kind of thinking about what a no deal would mean. And I remember all the stuff around the fact we're going to lose out on medicines, we're going to lose out on education and skills and training, and, um, you know, qualification recognitions, which makes it a lot quicker and easier for um, EU um, NHS uh, health and social care stuff, actually, to come to the country when we know at the moment we've got a shortage of that. Um, that just puts up barriers, which is actually going to risk the NHS uh, when we've got a pandemic, winter coming, and we still haven't got a vaccine, etc. I was then thinking about um, cross-border services in Ireland, where you've got a situation which came out of the Good Friday Agreement, where you do have um, anybody can go anywhere in Ireland to get a specialist, if you like, service in the health service. What would happen to that as a no deal? Because it actually rips up that whole kind of agreement there. Um, and that's quite uh, obviously devastating for people in Ireland, uh, north and south, should I say. But I was thinking more, just finally, because I'm not sure how long I've been talking, but um, at the moment, we've got a situation where we could have a no-deal Brexit on top of a pan pandemic. The winter is coming and we know um, how that puts stress and pressure on the NHS. And I was thinking about um, what we've got at the moment and I looked actually and researched it because it's actually quite interesting. Already at the moment, um, because of COVID, we've got a 19.6 weeks waiting list for people. Uh, and that's um, actually 83,000 people are stuck in a queue at the moment across the United Kingdom because of the pandemic. Uh, and that's the highest since 2008. So you've got all that pressure. Why throw Brexit on top of that? Again, it's just so irresponsible. And it really, really, really will be a massive stress and burden to the NHS. Um, so then I was just thinking finally about the vaccine. If there was a no deal, just like the government has set up the Environmental Protection Agency, we'll have this new agency, uh, which would happen anywhere my understanding would be. The Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency in the UK will replace the European Medicals Agency. And it will regulate um, how we bring onto the market and all the testing um, new medicines. And my understanding about the COVID vaccine, this is just one example, I'm sure there'll be lots, is why would you prioritise, um, you know, trying to sell this to the UK medical agency when you've got a bigger market in Europe? Uh, and so I've heard that, you know, the vaccines is going to go to Europe, not to the UK, because it's the complications of a new regulatory system, which has not yet even been set up, is too much for a company to navigate. So we're going to be like 12 to 14 months behind the vaccine. That's what I learned uh, today, just doing a bit of research. 
So I just wanted to use my, um, you know, kind of space just to say that the NHS will be really devastated by this no Brexit deal because it already is, you know, we've done a lot and everyone's worked really hard together, cross party, cross everything to keep the NHS going in the pandemic. And we really can't seriously allow a no deal Brexit to break that. So 15th of October is when Boris says is the, I don't know, deadline. And if there's no deal, then it will be a, a no deal. Whether he's bluffing or not, I'm not sure. I personally do believe there will be a deal, but it's going to be some kind of mini deal, which is probably not going to be that meaningful at the moment. And it will be a hard Brexit without all the level playing field and the protections that we'd ask for. So thanks, Anna. I'll leave that there. Thank you. meet myself sorry thank you so much Alison that, that was fascinating and again just a really stark reminder of the perfect storm that's coming for the NHS and social care the the two organizations that we've been out on our doorsteps clapping and um, are now going to face you know a really really difficult time over the next six months so thank you so much for setting that out for us so powerfully um, I'm delighted now to uh, introduce Baroness uh, Ellen Ed Morgan who um, is not only the um, Minister for International Relations and the Welsh language uh, in Wales but was actually um, the youngest member of the European Parliament when she was first elected there um, in 1994. So again, has a huge history uh, within the EU. So very much look forward to her comments. Thank you, Baroness Morgan. Thanks very much, Anna. God, that was ages ago since I was the youngest MEP. But uh, um, I'm, I'm glad to say I'm still as enthusiastic about the European project now as I was then. Uh, but thanks very much, Anna. And thanks, thanks to LME for, for setting this up because I don't know about you, but I'm feeling really bruised uh, at the moment with everything that's going on. And I just think it's really nice to speak with and, and to listen to like-minded people because uh, I, I just think we all need a bit of comfort at the moment that, that, to know that other people are feeling what we're feeling. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm uh, the Minister for International Relations uh, in the Welsh Government. Of course, the, the Welsh Government, the, the, the Labour Party, uh, it, we're, we're the only part of nation in the UK where the Labour Party is in power. And um, that gives us a, a special responsibility when it comes to the Labour Party. And of course, we can then make use of all the, the mechanisms and, and the power of, of the civil service that, that we have at our disposal. Um, but I think it's probably worth also emphasising that I was the first Minister for International Relations, and that was very much a direct response to Brexit. Uh, and it was very difficult for us in the Labour Party in Wales because, of course, most of us are enthusiastic supporters of the EU. And, of course, the nation of Wales voted to leave. And that was very, very difficult for us. But as a Labour government, we wanted to send out a very clear message that we are not turning our backs uh, on the European Union nor on the rest of the world. Um, and there are lots of reasons why... Uh, the cabinet in Wales are, are very much in favour of the European Union. It's not just because we, we, we think that this, we're culturally alike, that, that, um, that we have these value connections, um, but of course there is that very, very important um, economic relationship that is more critical to Wales than probably any other part of the United Kingdom. And it's, it's just worth setting out what some of those are. So because we're one of the poorest parts of the United Kingdom, we were eligible for um, tier one support. So we got about 600 million pounds from the EU uh, annually uh, to help us to rebuild our communities in the poorest parts of Wales, to help us to uh, build infrastructure, to help us have connectivity through broadband connections, to help us to uh, help develop a better uh, environment in Wales, help us to develop renewable energy, and not least to help us to support and retrain about 700,000 people in Wales through European Social Fund. The, the terrifying thing is, of course, that a lot of those people didn't vote uh, to remain a part of the European Union. And, and we in the Labour Party need to learn some lessons from that um, for when we're in government, because, you know, to, to make sure that we, if, we, if we're giving something to, to someone, we need to make sure they understand where that help is coming from. Um, the other thing to, to point out is that in, in Wales, um, the, our exports to the European Union amount to about um, 40% uh, in, for, for the United Kingdom is about 40%. In Wales, that figure is nearer, nearer 50%. So it, 
So the economic hit for us in terms of exports is going to be again greater than the rest of the United Kingdom. You look at something like our exports in lamb, 90% of our exports in lamb go to the European Union. And, and agriculture is an important part, certainly not, not, not so much of the economy, but certainly to the, the, the way of life in, in Wales. Our manufacturing brace, uh, until very recently, of course, with COVID, um, has been stronger than in many other parts of the United Kingdom. And if you look at places like Airbus, of course, COVID has, has had a massive effect on that. But automotive sector, if we see 10% being added to what people have to pay when it comes to um, the, the integrated uh, method of, of putting cars together now, that is going to devastate our economy as well. And that's not just something that is going to hurt Wales, it's going to hurt lots of other places. Already the Ford, Ford plant in Wales has shut. Um, we were promised new jobs by that lovely Brexiteer Jim Ratcliffe, who said he was going to bring in lots and lots of jobs to replace those from Ford. Funnily enough, he's now changed his mind and he's taken them to France. This is the man who said Brexit wasn't going to be a problem. Other things that, that are worth underlining is the fact that it's not just about um, losing our relationship with the European Union in terms of trade. There are 41 trade agreements that the EU has with 72 different countries around the world. And some of those are already been rolled over, but there are many that are really important to us that haven't. Canada, Turkey, Norway, those are still deals that haven't been done. And uh, those could be very problematic for us as well. Um, let me just um, talk briefly now about the internal market bill, because uh, I, I know that a lot of people are just focusing on um, the fact that actually they're breaking international law in, in, uh, in, in suggesting the way that this is set out. But for us, for us in Wales, there's a fundamental threat to the devolution settlement. It's not, of course, just for us here in Wales, but also in Scotland and Northern Ireland. And it's worth noting that devolution happened after we joined the EU. So we're coming out to a very radically different world. So those devolved powers that we had in Wales, that we were given when we were devolved over agriculture and fisheries and aspects of environment, the idea, of course, is that when they came back from Europe, they were going to come straight to us. Um, now, some of that will be respected, but with this new internal market deal, um, there is a real uh, possibility that the standards that we want to uh, adhere to in relation to uh, the way we do agriculture in Wales, for example, could be undermined because there's an assumption that if you can sell it on the, the English market, you should be able to sell it anywhere. So if we had very strong uh, standards, for example, in terms of uh, animal welfare in Wales that they didn't want to uh, insert in, in England, then that those products would be fine to come onto our market in Wales. So it fundamentally uh, undercuts what we want to achieve in the Welsh Government. Just to give you an example, a real life example, the European Union are keen to bring in a ban on single use plastics. There's about nine different um, things that they want to ban, including things like straws and food containers and cotton buds. We want to go along with the European Union approach to that. The UK Parliament are only suggesting to ban three of those rather than the nine that we want to ban. So that's a, a, a really good example of where right from the beginning we are going to be undermined in terms of what we want to do. They also want to uh, reserve the subsidy control, state aid. So we want to be able to support certain aspects uh, of, of our industries. Um, in order to protect some of the poorest parts of our communities. Again, the, the issues in relation to state aid may be undermined uh, by that internal market agreement. Um, the other thing they're doing is they're saying that they want to take, start spending money in devolved areas. Um, now, originally it was supposed to be uh, the European programs. So things were, of course, we, we were eligible for ERDF and ESF funding. But they're going much, much further now. They're saying, no, we want to spend some money on education, on health, on, on culture and sport. Those are all areas that are fundamentally devolved and they now want to start edging their way into those areas. 
And what we're really concerned about is, of course, um, there is a suggestion that now we'll have this new shared prosperity fund uh, that was going to give us that assurance. But what they want to do is to spend the money on projects that they want to bring forward. So they want to, for example, uh, expand the M4 motorway. Now, we in the Welsh Government have said we don't want that to happen. They could now theoretically say that prosperity fund, we're going to put that money into the M4 without any agreement from the Welsh Government. And the real danger for us is that they'll take that money away from our block grant. So this is a real problem for us. Um, we are absolutely objecting to uh, the internal market bill. Um, and there's no chance in hell that there's going to be a legislative consent motion from the Welsh Parliament. The problem for us then is that that is likely still to be flagged, just waved through in Parliament um, by, by the Conservative majority that they have. And that then causes a massive and fundamental project uh, pro um, problem for the devolution project that is happening across the UK. And let's not forget, Wales is probably not the biggest problem here. We are, you know, certainly in the Labour Party, committed to the union. Scotland is not quite in the same place and neither is Northern Ireland. And so we need to understand the fundamental threat that Brexit will have in terms of the coherence of the United Kingdom. And uh, that is probably my greatest concern. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, deeply worrying stuff. But then it seems we have a government that's playing fast and loose with the, the constitutional settlements in this country and um, the implications on people's lives in Wales, in Northern Ireland, in Scotland, across the UK are, are, are deeply concerning. So thank you very much for, for setting that out. Um, I'm going to call, we have two more speakers, um, so obviously we are rattling through our time, so I'm going to ask uh, Mike Buckley to speak next, and then we're delighted to have Catherine West as well. I will ask them to stick to their uh, seven minutes, because um, I would like to have 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. So, um, Mike, over to you. Mike is Director of Labour for a European Future, which was previously Labour for a public vote. So, uh, thanks, Mike. We look forward to what you've got to say. Great, thank you. And I'm so sorry that I was late uh, to this meeting. Um, but uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And apologies to uh, all the participants if I repeat things that have been said by prior speakers before I was here, which is very bad form, I realise, but I, hopefully I won't do that. Um, anyway, with the rest of my seven minutes, um, obviously we are, none of us are, are anywhere near where we wanted to be with Brexit. I mean, by now, had, had the world been a little bit different, Brexit wouldn't have happened, happened at all. And had it been different in a different way, then we would have had a second referendum and we would have been home free by now. And had it been different in a third way, we would have had a sensible government that even after a vote in favour of Brexit would have handled negotiations very, very differently. It would probably all be over by now. or We would still have a viable relationship with the European Union moving forward. But of course, we've had the government that we've had um, for the past four and a bit years and we are heading in a, in a very, very different direction. And the direction of travel for the last four years, from, from day one really, since the referendum, and certainly since Theresa May's Lancaster House speech in at the beginning of 2017, has been to shift to a harder and harder and harder form of Brexit. And the Brexit that we will get at the end of the year, whether it's a deal or whether it's no deal, will be far harder than, than even Theresa May's Brexit was. Back in the days when we used to talk about soft Brexit and hard Brexit, even the hard Brexit that was talked about then is, is incomparable. And I think we would all grasp it with, with both hands right now, you know, as to, as to compare it with uh, Boris Johnson's Brexit and, uh, and indeed with, with no deal. And even, even to look back at Johnson's deal, which itself was hard enough, but which, which was written down in the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration uh, last October, I think all of us would quite gladly go back to uh, Boris Johnson's political declaration right now because that contained commitments on a level playing field, workers' rights, environmental protections, state aid, you know, many things that are of deep importance to us. And really that we would have at that point looked at as, you know, the salvaging the minimum possible from our relationship with Europe. But even that um, Johnson doesn't want, doesn't want to go ahead with. So, so that's where we are. And uh, I mean, one thing one person said to me this morning on, on another call was, well, when, was uh, when were the single market and customs union on the ballot? And I think that's a really fair point. All of this is incredibly undemocratic. The public never voted on leaving the single market and the customs union. 
but both of those decisions are absolutely seismic. Um, and as Alunid was just pointing out, um, seismic not only for our future prosperity, but also seismic for our future um, survival as a, as a single nation, because the impact that that has on the Welsh economy and on the Scottish economy, and of course on Northern Ireland in a, in a whole host of different ways, and indeed with Scotland and Wales in terms of identity as well as economy, um, you know, the implications are huge. Um, so, so where we are is heading for either a very thin deal or for no deal. I, I, don't, I don't think any of us know which way it's going to go. And I, probably like me, you read things that say that Johnson hasn't even made up his mind yet which way he wants it to go. And we will only get a deal if Boris Johnson backs down on his commitments to leave the European Union um, and not be subject to some kind of controls on our state aid, and which is the thing that they seem to be most angry about and workers' rights and uh, environmental protections. And there is a bit of an argument over fisheries, but I believe that that would be resolved if, uh, if decisions were made. And so I don't think that's the sticking point really. But it, where we will end up, I, I don't think we know. I think if Johnson sticks to his guns and says that he will not back down on state aid and level playing field, then we will end up with no deal because the EU will not compromise a single market to the benefit of the UK which as we know is not because they don't like the UK and indeed like us and want a, want a viable relationship with us. It's because if they do it for us, they'll have to do it for everybody else. And we look at Brexit as a single decision between the UK and uh, the EU, but they of course look at it in the context of all their other external relationships, and which, which never really gets in UK press. But in the context of that, there's, there's simply zero chance that they're going to give Boris Johnson what he wants. So, so we're heading towards, well, we're in <laughs> a very difficult autumn on all of this and uh, need to decide where we're going to go. And I think for us as, um, and this is my second point really, for, I think for us in the Labour Party, the question that we need to be asking, as well as what, what's going to happen or what's the government going to do, the, the second question we need to ask is, well, what is Labour's responsibility and what is Labour's best course of action at this point? And obviously Labour saying nothing on all of this is, is, is not an option. You know, Labour's job at the moment, sadly, is still to oppose a terrible government rather than to be in government. But as part of that job, we need to be alerting the public to the damage that's being done. And we need to do that, of course, over failures over test and trace and coronavirus, but we also need to be doing it over Brexit. One of the things that um, saddens me, but also, you know, amazes me really, is just how ignorant the general public are and indeed lots of Labour members as well, about the implications of Brexit and the changes that are coming. And that isn't the public's fault. It's because they have not been well served by the media. And indeed, in large part, have not been well served by the Labour Party either over the last four years. And I realise that Brexit is incredibly complex, but I really do think, feel at the moment we could be doing a better job of articulating to people the changes that are coming, the implications that has for our lives. And that doesn't need to be framed in a, an anti-Brexit kind of way. You know, we can do it in terms of we should get a better deal that does X, Y and Z uh, and leave on good terms rather than bad terms. But I think now as we're approaching the cliff edge, I think the public are increased. I find the public are increasingly aware that change is coming, but they don't know the implications of that and they don't know the details. And I think if now, now is the time to step up and explain. And that's not just us. It's also other parties and it's also the media. But in the end, Keir Starmer is probably, you know, probably the second or third uh, person in the country who is able to get media attention, you know, after Boris Johnson and maybe Rishi Sunak. And, and he, and I think we as a party should use that to the best of our ability over the next few months. And the will, I'm very aware that there are people in the party with a different opinion who think that we should just shut up about Brexit and move on. But I don't think that that would even serve the ends that they wanted to serve. It would not help us win the next general election, partly because Brexit is going to be a disaster and the public will, once the disaster ensues, try and work out whose fault it is. And fair enough, they will blame Boris Johnson and I think that they, they will blame Boris Johnson. But I think they would also look to others and say, well, why didn't you speak up before you knew about this? So I think it's incumbent on us on that level. But it's also incumbent on us because while the, the simplistic media narrative is that Labour needs to win back the red wall seats and therefore we just need to accept Brexit and move on because everybody up there is a Leave voter, that, that isn't true and it's never been true. In, in the 2016 referendum, 
Um, lots of people up there voted leave and lots of people voted remain. And the majority of Labour voters, as in 2015 or 2017 Labour voters, voted remain rather than leave. So most of our voters up there are remainers anyway. And in the 2019 election, we lost about as many remain voters as we lost leave voters. So we need to get, re we need to get remain voters back next time, just as much as we need to get leave voters red back next time, even to get the red wall back. That is to say nothing of Scotland, where we had 20, uh, 41 seats in 2010, and that went down to one, um, and we've got one now after a slight uptick in, in 2017. And of course, as we know, Scotland is chock full of Remainers, um, and we want them to vote for us. And constitutional questions in Scotland, I mean, I'm not Scottish, and I'm not in Scotland, but, but obviously they are of central importance. And I think we also need to recognise that the way that Brexit is going is making Scottish independence more likely. I'm probably running out of time, I think I am. So I'll just finish with this point. And I realise that all of this is, it is complicated for Labour, and I get that, and I'm not saying it's easy. And I'm a wholehearted supporter of Keir Starmer and Angela Rayner and the, you know, the party leadership. But not talking about this isn't, isn't going to help. And, um, and I'm not saying that we're not. I mean, I know that Catherine says, a, uh, for example, says a huge amount on this and it's very clear that Labour wants a, a close relationship with Europe in the future. So we are saying things, but, but I don't think that they are, I don't think the things that we're saying on this are, are reaching far enough into the public mind. But the way to win this is, 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 not, is not to be quiet and it isn't to just accept everything the Conservatives are doing. We wouldn't do it in any, with any other policy of the Conservatives is to have a vision for the future of the UK that beats the English nationalism of Brexit and beats the Scottish nationalism of the SNP. And I'm not sitting here saying that's easy, but that is our job over the next four years. And we, we can't go into the next election without a, a clear and serious answer that aligns with our values on Brexit or indeed on Scottish independence. And fair enough, those are both quite hard questions, but they're questions we need to answer. I'll stop there. Absolutely right. Thank you, Mike. That's great. And um, a very powerful challenge, I think, um, to, to our shadow ministers who are here with us tonight as well. So um, that kind of links us nicely to our, our last speaker, um, Catherine West. Um, delighted to welcome Catherine. She's um, been in Greens since 2015 and is a, a good friend of mine and has been a great champion for her constituents. But I'm proud to say he's also the shadow Europe and America's minister. So we're very much looking forward to um, hearing what Catherine has to say and how she will respond to that challenge set down from Mike about uh, how we uh, how we talk about Brexit and how we have a positive agenda on it, um, you know, within the realities of, of, of where we are electorally. Catherine, over to you. Thank you, Anna. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Because um, I had to have the two screens so I could hear all of you. I've got rid of the other one now. So if I suddenly go blank, can you wave at me? <laughs> um, I wanted to thank you, Anna, first of all, for taking on the leadership of, um, you know, the whole sort of Europe question, because I think it helps so much to have someone who knows the facts, who's been through the agony and the ecstasy, um, and who can bring us all together. Um, and as you know from this place, sometimes you get a bit too lost in the day-to-day -day detail and you realise that you're not spreading the bigger picture around. So I hope we can work together to do as much as we can outside Parliament as well as in Parliament. Um, and also your work in the co-op as well, because I think there's much more that we could be doing to genuinely cooperate with European neighbours and lay out that positive vision. In my very brief seven minutes, I wanted to talk about um, the sort of the Tory, which is basically the negative message, and then what we need to say, which isn't just attacking them, but saying what we think and how we're different. So um, obviously at the moment, right in right today, it's actually quite easy to be attacking the Tories on Brexit because Mrs May has just stood up in the House of Commons and said she can't support the bill, which the internal market bill, which is going through. She's absolutely furious. Um, and obviously Ed Miliband also made a very inspiring speech last week. So at the moment, I feel as though we actually probably are winning the argument um, and that's a really exciting place to be. And this question of trust, it's coming back again and again, whether it's over Northern Ireland, whether it's over the, 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 the Good Friday Agreement, whether it's, between, whether it's the relationship with the US and what they can expect of the UK with a future tra trade deal pending. Um, and also what it means sort of geopolitically. So um, obviously we want to work very closely with Europe on those bigger questions like 
Israel-Palestine, Iran, Belarus, um, Russia, and yet I think for the Europeans, they're thinking, can they trust what we're going to say next if we're about to break the law in our, um, in our own parliament? Um, and obviously China, with the rise of China, wondering can they trust us um, on that question as well? And um, will, be, will we be working with Europe to try and both hold China to account, but also look at whether we can build on um, the success of the European Union in having an honest trade relationship with China without having to pretend about the human rights picture. And of course, for all of you who are pro-European, you'll all know that that's the beauty of the, um, the committee in Europe, both the trade committee and the human rights element of that, that you have that expertise from all those different countries and a huge market which China will actually listen to as opposed to you know, our rather petite market, which China can sort of ignore when they go, when we do come eventually to do a trade deal with them. If we're critical on human rights, they could just say, well, we don't really need to listen to you anymore. We can just listen to Europe because we're gonna get a good trade deal with them. So you know, we're a bit snookered um, in some of our geopolitical um, side of things. I also wanted just briefly to join up some of the dots, which I'm sure you're all thinking as well. You know, DFID has gone now, which was our excellence abroad. Um, we've got tonight's um, internal market bill, which is threatening to break the law, international law. The government is sending the Navy into the channel to um, stop um, desperate migrants. Um, we have threats around human rights legislation coming forward and generally trying to chip away at what has been accepted human rights for years. And of course, the culture wars. And, um, you know, some of you will have seen in the newspaper over the weekend that one of the Tory MPs has said he's not going to do unconscious bias training. What does Black Lives Matter to him? I mean, he's not going to bother with that. And got thousands of retweets, you know, this reigniting of this rhetoric. Um, and I think we have to be very careful. And I think that's part of the reason why, you know, the Kia and Angela and so on have been very careful to stick on the facts of COVID and to stick on that concept of um, competence. But I think as we go forward, we do also have to paint what we all know about the Tories, which you cannot trust them. Um, and also it's the same old Tories around things like giving money to, um, you know, using the financial centre of London as a bit of a, a tax haven, um, taking dodgy Russian money, some of those things that we know about the Tories. And they're the sorts of things that I hope as we go forward, we'll be able to develop. Because I think we do have to focus on competence, but I think we've got to go even more so that a light bulb goes in the head of people that says, yes, we know that about the Tories. Um, so just really, what do we believe in and what do we want to do differently? Um, and I think what we want to do is for musicians like Horace, who wants to travel to um, Europe, we want to have that um, free access, not more costs for lowly paid, low paid musicians or even well paid musicians. We want to maintain our values across Europe. Um, we want to work across borders on COVID. We want to be a part of the European vision on stopping a Europe wide recession. And of course, we want to um, be very, very close to our European neighbours. And um, as we go through the National Policy Forum debate, I'm hoping to work closely um, with Richard Howarth and some of the others to think about this positive message, because we all know what we don't want and what we don't want to be like. But um, that's where I think at the moment the Tories are trying to carve themselves out of space as being buccaneering, sort of free trade buccaneers, even though they want all that state aid. There's a lot of dissonance in there, but I think we've got to think now, how can we be strong about our own values? And um, there's some work that I mentioned to Mike before about sort of going around our CLPs, maybe with some um, sort of, not like a survey, but some kind of interactive process where we talk about what does our future look like, which is positive and we're proud of, um, and that we can talk about where we can't just slag off the Tories, but that we actually have something really um, precious, but also strong that we can um, project about our own vision of Britain in the world. Thank you, Chair.
That's great. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you. And, um, you know, it's great that we've actually got some kind of online conference in the next few days as well, because there's a lot of us sitting at home very excited and looking forward to hearing Keir, for example, set out his vision really for the first time. You've all had to respond to crisis management over the last few months. And I think hopefully, you know, we'll get to hear something this week about the, the real vision for the party. So, Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to ask people to put questions into the Q&A. We've got a few minutes to take some. And while you're thinking of your q and I thought I'd just throw one back, which is particularly for Bill and Catherine. So sorry to put you both on the spot, but there's been a few bit in the chat and obviously you've heard colleagues today put a bit of a challenge back to the party, which is that, you know, yes, we know we have to, you know, accept the reality of where we are, but we do have things to fight for and important things to fight for around workers' rights and so on and, and, and access to, to, um, to different benefits. So my challenge to, to Bill and Catherine would be to say, what, what are our priorities? What's Labour's priorities in fighting for over the next few months? What are the red lines? Um, what are the bits that you're, you're really going to, you have to, to be battling for in Parliament really ahead of, um, even if we, you know, whatever scale of deal we do get? What are the bits that are non-negotiable for you guys? So, um, Bill, I don't know if you want to, to kick off there. Uh, yeah, well, it, it is. They've got to, the government has to keep its promise and get a deal. And I think I think actually Richard gave a very good answer to this. It's rights, it's standards, it's protections, it's the environment, it's workers, it's manufacturing jobs. Uh, no deal is catastrophic for for manufacturing jobs across the the country. Um, but it's a problem in services as well. We, we've got to keep the focus on, on those economic relationships, on those security concerns, absolutely right from Richard again, um, and on, on reminding the public that this, the consequences are, that the public doesn't want no deal. Uh, we are in the right place here. It's not about refighting Brexit. It's not about leave or remain. That's dumb. We've left, but we have to get a deal. And we have to get a deal delivers a relationship that is right for our people. Great, thank you very much Bill. And Catherine, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, pointing out I think that triple whammy of recession, COVID, climate change, um, and trying to really just find our own way as well and accept that that requires conversations and consultation. Okay, and would any other colleagues on, on the panel um, speakers like to add their, um, you know, extra bit on, on things they would like to see non-negotiable, where they'd really like to see the party pushing? Horace or Richard, Alison? Well, I've, I've said already about, you know, there should be, it should be easy to work in Europe. For, for anybody who, who needs to work there and for my members to be able to travel around and work in Europe is going to be essential that it's cheap and easy to do um, and for you know musicians to be able to come from EU uh, countries and work in the UK that should be cheap and easy too uh, it should be reciprocal great thank you Mike Richard I is there anything Alison anything I just add a again I just add that that I think you know, we, we've got to accept that previously we were part of a single market, the European single market. At the moment, we don't have the scaffolding for a single UK market, and that needs to be created. And uh, for that to work properly, there needs to be a degree of respect. Um, but at the moment, that scaffolding doesn't exist. Okay, thank you. Anything else from Michael, Richard or Alison? Or I'll take the questions you wave at me if you'd like to say anything if not I'll take the questions that are in the Q&A um this one from uh, an anonymous attendee does Wales have the powers currently I think that was referring to uh to, to your statement Baroness Morgan um Tories are saying there's a power grab because the devolved governments don't already have these controls I don't know if you want to clarify on that anymore thank you um, thank you yes um Yes, we do have the powers. We have the powers over um, health, education, aspects of the economy, aspects of the environment, um, sports, culture, all of those things. And the point is that all of those things were things where we had pooled a degree of, of our power with the European Union. Um, and when uh, we, we left the European Union, those powers should have come back automatically to us. Um, and, and we insist, in particular, if they're starting to poke around with the prosperity fund, 
um, and you know that they should respect what we want to do. We're the people on the ground. We know what needs to be done. We know what skills we need to develop. You know, for them to try and organize it and manage it from London with no idea about how things work in Wales would be absolutely, uh, it, would, it would be a fundamental mistake. And, and we in the Labour Party need to make sure that we're in the right place on this, these things as well. Right. Thank you very much. Yes, go for it, Richard. Yeah. Yeah, there's an interesting question which relates to state aid and the that's been typed yes. by Dee Gutter in the if I pronounce yeah. it correct, in the uh, question and answer thing, and um, right, yeah. it's it's quite interesting because of course the Tories trying to say we want to break EU state aid rules or not follow them so that we can subsidise British industry. At first sight, you think, oh, hang on, that's, we want to help British industry. We want the right to step in. Aren't they treading on our territory? So it's important to get across why we agreed a common set of rules across Europe on state aid. Uh, EU and EEA countries, it applies. We agreed common rules that allows state aid under certain conditions, but regulates it to stop countries effectively outbidding each other for the favours of multinational companies. You know, please invest here and we'll give you this amount. And another country says, oh, we'll give you even more if you come here. And then the richest country wins out. That's why we have a com common set of rules. Those rules do allow structural aid to sectors in difficulty Hence, Leonard being quite right that when that happens, it should be done properly and devolved where appropriate. Those rules do allow that, but what they don't allow is subsidizing a particular company so that it can undercut another company in a single market. And we've never really managed to get that message across internally within our Labour Party debate at times. So I think it's, it's something that's going to be quite a challenge to get across more widely in this debate, uh, which is a public debate beyond the party now. Can I add Absolutely to that? Right. Uh, Thank you, Phil. Yes, it'd be great yeah, to hear you. Yeah, Anna, and you will, you will have um, you know, very uh, frustrated memories of the government's failure to use state aid in 2015 in the seal crisis when they, mm -hmm. they failed to bail out the SSI uh, steelworks at Redcar. Um, yeah. and blocked the European Union from taking effective action against Chinese dumping of steel across the European Union. Um, meanwhile, other countries did save their steel industries whilst our, um, uh, our Emperor Nero's uh, fiddled while the steel, in steel industry burned. And um, we saw again the failure in 2018 um, uh, with British steel, didn't we? Um, I mean, I'm just looking at the figures. Uh, Germany spent 1.31% of GDP on state aid last year. France, 0.76%. Uh, Portugal, 1.59% of GDP. Our figure, just 0.38%. Our worst members of the European Union operating that regime. And the government, I mean, George Peretz is the, uh, the, the legal expert on this, the QC. Um, and he, he keeps pushing the question, the government have promised to publish the state aid regime and, and won't. They, are, they will not allow scrutiny of what they are doing. I mean, this is a, a, a growing trend. We've seen it right across the trade, you know, the trade bill with the uh, deals that are going through there or with what's going on with the United States. And we're seeing it with, with state aid and in the internal market bill. Um, if they would tell us what the regime, what this fantastic regime is that they, they want to introduce, maybe we could, we, we could judge what we uh, make a decision about what we thought of it. Um, I tell you what, it leaves a suspicion. We've seen Absolutely. all this cronyism over the summer, all these hundred million pound, multi hundred million pound contracts going to uh, friends of uh, Dominic Cummings, Michael Gove uh, et al., um, 150 million pounds worth of face masks that were unusable, being one example in my mind is it was a DIT uh, advisor who was uh, who, who was the link uh, you know is this just about more opportunities for them to make vast sums of money I think you're absolutely right Bill I'm, I'm sorry to cut across you but I've had the warning we we're about to get chucked out any minute right. so uh, I just wanted to say a huge thank you before we go to all of our speakers to everyone who's participated and added questions and comments um, if you'd like to join another webinar uh, yeah. On anti-Semitism um, on the 8th of October at 7:30 p.m. If you're not a member, please do join us or subscribe to our newsletter and get involved. But thank you so much to all of you for your participation tonight, and uh, you know the fight back starts here. So thank you for all your support. Take care.
Thanks, Adam. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.